how technology influences decision making and how organizations are run. Um, the social networking aspect of technology, the uh, efficiency and the potential within technology as an example. Um, I still think at the end of the day though that, that we're a, 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 a I think we're people making decisions, and I think we're people trying to do things, even if we're using technology. And that's not to say that we don't get trapped in a paradigm where technology dictates certain cultural developments and certain ways of doing things. So uh, the, the advent of social networking has meant that we can connect with lots of people, and so the way of doing things becomes this sound bite nature of communication. And it becomes a way of people distributing their thoughts without necessarily having thought through them, planned to planned out arguments, constructed it properly as in the old days, and now people can get their ideas out quite quickly without necessarily a lot of thought behind them. So my point is that technology also informs the way we do things. But I think the challenge for organizational leaders is to keep the humanity within that. And I think it's gonna it affects the way organizations run. So what I mean by that is and I'm not sure this, is, this challenge has really changed at all since the start of humanity, since the start of people coming together. The challenge for me remains how do you get cohesively bring a group of people together around a cause in such a way that they work in the most efficient way towards the outcome that the institution is trying to achieve. I think in the world the challenge is how do you do that in a capitalist system where the cause isn't defined in financial terms. So that's, the, I think, the particular challenge we're facing today. But there's, there's a legacy behind the inequality in the world that means it's not going to change very easily. We've got environmental issues that we're dealing with. We've got health issues that we're dealing with. We can't just continue to pursue a purely profit motive. But then how do we take institutions within a capitalist system and focus them as a group around a non-financial cause um, in an equally efficient way as many financial profit-driven institutions have been able to do. Um, but at the core, once again, I think it comes back to the same question that any leader of any group of people has been asking, I'd imagine, for hundreds if not thousands of years, how do you build a cohesive social unit, um, a cooperative unit, uh, to achieve a particular outcome? I was fortunate enough to be a Yale World Fellow last year, and I got to spend a lot of time with some of the most privileged, smartest, A-type minds in America, and probably hence in the world, for a semester. And, and one of the things I found was the sense in each of them that they were individually so important. It seems to be a pressure that the university and society made it. I think more importantly, the university was putting them under to go out and do something important in the world. So the starting point in, in answering your question is made to say what I said to a lot of them, which they really appreciated here, which is, you're not that important. And that's the truth. Individually, we're not that important. Because the problems are so much bigger than any one of us individually, we've got to recognize that we do form part of the system. And if we can see the system for what it is, we can perform a role within that. And that's not necessarily a role as a leader. It can equally be a role as a follower. Because a leader has, the classic saying, a leader has no power without a follower. But I think there's also a dynamic between a leader and a follower that creates an outcome. And so there's a, there's a role for everyone um, within the system to influence the way the system moves. So the, the question is how do you then influence that system and what am I doing individually to do that? Um, well, I think the point of leverage in the system comes back to this idea of social identity, social cohesion of social groups, and, um, and maybe, maybe to illustrate an example of how I'm approaching that, um, I can give you a, a, an example of what we've seen in healthcare system. So we ran a retention survey in rural hospitals across uh, the country to understand what the factors are that drive health workers out of the system and what are the factors that keep health workers in the system. And the survey we use is a classic retention survey that any corporate would use to understand what the, the factors are around engagement and satisfaction within the institution. What we found there is that by far, the thing that keeps health workers in the system and attracts them to the system is a sense of purpose in their work. And that makes sense. A doctor becomes a doctor to help people, a nurse becomes a nurse to provide care for people. 
On the other side, the thing that drives them out of the system is their work environment, the culture, the way things are done that frustrates them living out their purpose. And as a result, even though the nurse may very well be a nurse to help people, that same nurse will take a two-hour lunch break while someone is suffering. And the same, and so this, this conflict between the inner values and the purpose and the latent things that drive us to do what we do, and yet the disparate way we see those things being lived out in society um, is, 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 is essentially where I see the problem lying, for me. So if I was going to operate somewhere within the system, I'd try and, as a point of leverage, try and close that gap. I don't think people in our society take the time to self-reflect and really understand what's going on inside them, to understand um, the things they're reacting to. Uh, and if they did that, if they were aware of that, they could rather act than react. Um, so there's all these things that contribute to the gap between the values that I think essentially we all want the same thing and the, what we see lived out in society. So that for me is, is the, the crux of it. How do you close that gap? Now, society for me is made up of different, lots of different kinds of units. So you can see the family as one unit, and um, society is made up of lots of different families. I don't think this society in itself is a unit. Society is too broad to be a unit. Another unit of society is that of the institution. Groups of people have come together to exercise some kind of uh, purpose in their work. Um, and there, you can influence the way people um, behave by creating a culture in the workspace that delivers on a particular purpose that's beneficial to society in a way that where the behaviors in the, in, the, in the workspace are aligned with those. So for me, in the work that I'm doing at HP and for the work I'd like to see HP doing on a much larger scale in the health system is how do we influence the culture by defining the latent things that people are living out in their workplace in a much more measurable way and building the artifacts of that so that it's easy for them to live it out so they're not frustrated by aspects of culture and aspects of work environment. If you look at the, you look at the businesses that are really done the best in the world, financially, um, a business like, um, like McKinsey, it's got an incredibly strong culture. People know the way things are done in that space. Um, if you look at the, you know, you think that the kind of store you might go to on repeat occasions, or the kind of products you might purchase on repeat occasions, things like Apple products, for those people who like Apple products, it's, there's something in the consistency of the experience that's created for its, their customers that can only be generated through creating a culture where people feel like there's a purpose to their work. If nobody cared about aesthetics and the experience of users with technology, Apple would not be able to produce the products it's producing. So yes, I do think it's important for all institutions to have that. I think the knock-on effect from that is um, goes beyond the institution. Because I know for myself, if, if I'm, when I've worked in work environments which I've found very frustrating, then I am frustrated as a human being. So I go out into the street and I'm frustrated with the guy who bumps into me. And I'm frustrated with my friends or my family who say something to me that irritates me. Whereas if I, I found that if people are working in a work environment where their, where their inner values are satisfied, then they're much less likely to be um, frustrated and reactionary outside of that space as well. So the knock-on effects, you can, never, you can never be so arrogant to know what impact you're doing, what impact is on, on, on the world at large of what you're doing. But you've got to, I think, in every moment, try and live in such a way that the ramifications of what you're doing are potentially very good. One thing I've figured out is that I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> so um, it's really important to keep learning and keep growing and keep speaking to other people who are in similar positions and trying to make the kinds of decisions that I am being asked to make um, to understand where they're going wrong and how they have done things. And I've, I'm lucky, it's, it's only happened more recently, but it's, and I've developed quite a good network of people with different types of experience around me who, whose ideas I've drawn and whose sense of asking me questions and they're verifying what I'm doing holds me in check so that you know, power doesn't corrupt us, as Lord Acton once famously said. Um, so yeah, important to synthesize the experiences and the knowledge of the experts in your field. Whether that's the technical experts, 
the technical aspects of what your organization is trying to deliver, or the managerial or leadership aspects of what you're trying to do. Um, I actually had a, I was thinking the other day, how much further humanity we would be, and the planet would be, if every generation of humans didn't start from scratch, and actually learned from where the previous generation ended off. But we all need to make these mistakes over and over and over in every generation. I think sometimes we go forward and sometimes I think we're actually just going backwards, I don't know. So the point there is ask questions, synthesize the knowledge of others, never think that you know the answers. And I, think, I don't think any of us really know the answers. The second thing is that um, I would say if I were to start AHP again from scratch, I would start with the technical stuff. I would start by thinking what the environment, this is going back to the, the answer to the previous question so that you know my philosophy in life is pretty consistent, but I would go back to how do you, what, what culture am I trying to create here and how do I consciously create that culture and by culture I mean how do I get a group of people to do things so that the customer experience at the end of the day is always a positive one so that in that way we deliver what we need to deliver. I wouldn't just start it with, okay, the need is doctors on the ground, how do we recruit doctors? That's important, but the starting point needs to be, what's the culture that creates a positive experience for a doctor so that every single time they want to go and work in a rural area? And that's where, it took, it took me too long to make, that, to make that connection. I was too focused on the technical for too long. Um, and I think it's, for me it's been really important to realize that, um, that building the right culture will create the outcome rather than trying to create the outcome itself. And there are various tools that we've got now for doing that. We've actually codified, for example, our purpose and our values, the latent things that drive us to do what we do. We've codified those, articulated those as a measurable set of behaviors. And those behaviors are then being embedded in our performance management systems and how we recruit, how we make decisions, how we dress, how we talk. It's been embedded in the organizational structure. And so everywhere we go now, we're able to live out our culture. It doesn't always work. People need feedback, positive feedback. You've done something behaviorally in the right way, but you should, uh, and you should repeat. And developmental feedback, you know, this specific behavior that I saw um, hampered this part of the work we need to deliver and needs to be done differently next time. Um, so there's all sorts of mechanisms we put in place to make sure that happens now. Um, and we're seeing great results from that. And then, Another lesson for me in this is to is to I can't describe anything. I mean, it's, it's going to sound cheesy, but there's something about love that has to come into it. You've got to love what you do. You've got to um, feel comfortable with the contribution you're making to the world. You've got to feel comfortable with the, the culture, the environment you're living in. You've got to um, when you encounter a problem as much as possible, be aware of the reactions that you will naturally have given your socialization over your life, and rather act in a way that kind of cares for, shows kindness towards, is empathetic towards, shows love for whatever the problem is. And I think if you can take that approach, you will not only will people be willing to probably come along with you if they think the same way, you will certainly attract people who do, but you'll also be able to find much more objectively, without your subjective your childhood issues coming into play, you'll be able to find objectively a solution to the problem and enjoy it and love it in the process. I think the, the kind of layman's misnomer of entrepreneurship is that there's some guy who has a whole lot of ideas and takes a linear path from A to Z, which is success through his or her own um, drive, intelligence, problem-solving abilities, uh, creativity. And that's, that's the picture people have of entrepreneurship. This is completely incorrect. I am not an entrepreneur. I work with a whole lot of people who are entrepreneurially minded. They're people on my board who have been with me since the start, who I always go to, what do you think of this? And they come with new ideas all the time. And then, I take those and I synthesize them with other things that we've got and I try to find a way to make it work. Or sometimes other people in the organization try to make, make it work. 
the people who I work with in my team who are out in the field and are coming up with ideas, and I'm continuing trying to figure out ways of incorporating their ideas into what we do. There's stuff I've read, there's books I've read, there's ideas that have come from hundreds of years ago. I've been reading a book and thinking that's a great idea, so it applies today, it can be applicable in this sense. So that idea of entrepreneurship firstly is incorrect because um, it's not one person who comes up with the ideas, it's a lot of different people who contribute various ideas, and then you need particular people who can make them pragmatic and make them work and implementable. The second way which is wrong is it's never a linear path. The path goes like this, or sometimes it goes backwards, and sometimes it goes forwards, and sometimes it goes back to the extent that there's failure. And then when there's failure, we blame people and we say, this person is a failure. We should be encouraging failure, because you cannot, you cannot succeed the majority of the time, and you cannot succeed unless you learn where to fail. So that windy path, even though at the end it's nice to tell a story I started here and we got to there, is the reality. And I think people getting into starting things must go into it thinking I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can to make this work, but I'm going to bring people's ideas and I'm going to realize that it's not going to necessarily succeed, but if it doesn't, society will laud me for my attempt and the lessons I've learned in the process because I'm being lauded for having tried, I will apply to the next venture. Wow.